1 Samuel 27, verse 1, to chapter 28, verse 2, is our passage this morning. 1 Samuel 27. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish the son of Maok, king of Gath. David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told, told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns, that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as Shur, to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, Against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of the Jeremelites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, lest they should tell about us and say, So David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking, He has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore he shall always be my servant. In those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war, to fight against Israel. And Achish said to David, Understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. David said to Achish, Very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with open hearts, open minds, asking you to open our eyes to see the truth of your word. We pray that our hearts would be ready to receive it with joy that our minds would be ready to understand it. That we would trust in you to apply it. Father, more than anything, we want our church to be a group of people gathered around your word, growing, gaining nourishment. As you pour into us, But we don't want that study, the understanding to stop with our minds. We don't want to become so knowledgeable that we're just puffed up, but we want that knowledge to result in hearts that are engaged in worship of the one true and living God. We want that knowledge to flow out of our mouths to the world around us as we impart to them the gospel of peace who are right now lost and dying. So we pray this morning that your word not be to us merely a mental exercise, but it might be fuel for the fire of gospel witness. We pray that it, it build our church firmly on the foundation of Christ. That for many centuries to come, so long as Christ tarries, 
we would never, ever waver from it. Long after each and every one of us in this room are gone, may our children and our children's children boldly proclaim the same gospel. We pray that you would do that in and through the families here, through the parents here, that you would set our hearts on fire with the God of the Scriptures, that we would come to love who we find there, cherish you as King and Savior, and proclaim you to the world, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in our church has been our habit for some time now to work our way through the Bible passage by passage. And so, it's a joy of mine to come to the office on Monday morning and to begin studying for whatever passage we're going to be going into that week. And one of the joys of that, as we've gone through 1 Samuel in particular, is that every week I often have at least a few things that catch me off guard, that surprise me, that I didn't maybe see before or hadn't noticed before. And, and, and then some new understanding about the passage that I perhaps didn't have before. One of the troubling portions of doing that week in and week out is that sometimes you get to a passage like the one that's sitting in front of us today where you find many people, scholars of all stripes, written commentary after commentary, can't agree on what is really happening in it. So it becomes challenging as we talk about it around the office, and even amongst the three of us in the office, we're not reading it the same way. So it becomes a bit more of a challenge then to really figure out what is being said here and what it means. What I've found as we've gone through 1 Samuel is that there are quite a few complex people in the Old Testament. And, and even in the book of 1 Samuel, there's a lot of complexity in the way the story develops, isn't there? I've heard from people that are in our small groups, as typically what we do in small groups is, is discuss how we apply the text of Scripture to our lives. And so we, we normally go through three or four discussion questions and, and talk about it in a group. And I've heard some of the conversations spill out from many small groups as to different characters that we find popping up in 1 Samuel. Namely, Abigail was one a few chapters ago. She goes and, and intervenes with David and keeps him from going to kill that fool Nabal. And she's married to Nabal, and she throws her husband under the bus. And she calls him a fool, as his name would suggest. And many people have come to me and gone, well, what do we make of, of Abigail? Because she seems like she just threw her husband under the bus. Is she really a heroine? And then she went and, and got in a polygamous relationship with David. What do we think about that? The point is, there's a lot of complex characters, but not just in 1 Samuel. Back up to the book of Judges. Not many mothers are wanting to name their kids Samson, are you? A dog, maybe, you might name him Samson if he's big and strong, but not your kid. Yet, turn to Hebrews 11, and you got him there in the Hall of Faith. So what do you do with these complex figures that pop up throughout the Old Testament. I think what we have to understand is that the Old Testament is laying a foundation for when perfect comes. We've got to get that in our mind that every character that we're going to see, every person that we're going to see in the Old Testament is going about this very imperfectly. Not really governed by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, has the indwelling Holy Spirit. They're doing this imperfectly. They're sinners. They're complex. They've got flaws. And everything they do has a bit of imperfection along with it. 
So it's laying a foundation for what we will ultimately see in the New Testament when perfect eventually does come. With that in mind, we open up our Bible to this text that's in front of us. And I remember being a kid in in grade school, and the teacher would come in, and she would say, put your thinking caps on, we've got a lot to do. You know that, when she says that? And, And every time she said that, my heart just dropped. It was so disappointing. I was hoping she would say, it's time for recess. But that's not what she would say. She would say, put your thinking caps on, there's a lot to do. Well, this morning... You're going to need your thinking caps on. We're going to have to think through what's happening here in the passage because there's a dilemma presented to us at the very beginning. And that is, what's happening with David? Does he trust God or does he not trust God? We see this first dilemma. It appears right out of the gate there in verse 1. But first, before we go to verse 1, back up to the previous chapter, 26, verse 24. Look at what he says there. Behold, this is David talking, and he's talking to Saul. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. That sounds like a man who has come to trust in the Lord, does it not? Now, flash forward to the first verse of 27. Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. Now if you remember, last chapter, last week as we were talking about this, we saw that David had this epiphany that he came to over the course of three chapters, 24, 25, and 26. In 24, he lashed out at Saul, cutting off the corner of his robe, and his heart struck him. God stopped him in his tracks, essentially, of conviction of sin. And he vowed never to do that again. I won't reach out my hand against the Lord's anointed. In the next chapter, the fool Nabal really makes him mad. He decides to lace up his boots and get on his sword and go after him in war, and he's, he's uh, Abigail intercedes for Nabal and says, please stop right there. And David is convicted yet again and realizes he's tried to save himself by his own hand. And he, he thanks Abigail for intervening and he goes back his own way, essentially repenting. The third time he encounters, he, this time he encounters Saul again. And instead of lashing out and killing him or even being tempted to, he says, no, no, I will trust that the Lord will deliver me. Whatever may happen to Saul, he may die in battle one day. He may die just by natural causes. The Lord may take him a number of different ways, but I'm going to wait and I'm going to trust in the Lord to deliver me. And yet, like two verses later, in 27.1, David says in his heart, I'm going to die by Saul's hand, and so I need to get out of here. What do we make of this? David, do you trust in God, there in the land where you're at, or do you not? If David really does trust God, that he is the anointed king, that he is the one to take the throne in Israel, shouldn't he then trust that God who has anointed him, who has called him out from shepherding sheep to to shepherd his people, shouldn't he trust that God is going to protect him? Shouldn't he trust that God is going to save him? So, So what are we to make of this passage? So if you looked at all the commentaries that have ever been written on this chapter, half of them would say, David is in sin here. And half of them would say, David is not in sin here. So the choice is yours. You you may not land where I land, but I'm going to try to convince you that I think this is the way we should read it. First, look at verses 2 to 4. I want you to see how this chapter flows and what's really happening in this passage. Verse 2. So David arose and went over, he and the 600 men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, and David with his two wives, Hinnom of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer 
sought him. The first thing that we see right away is that David was right in his assessment of what Saul was going to do. Remember what's happening in the previous chapter. Saul has, as he has done a number of times, Saul has told David, you're right. David, I shouldn't have come after you. You're innocent. You didn't want to kill me. I flew off in a tyrannical rage, and I shouldn't have done that, and I see that now. Why don't you come back with me? I repent of all my sins, essentially. And time and again, Saul has gotten home. That evil spirit that we saw rush upon him some chapters ago kind of gets into him again, and he starts reasoning with himself. David is after me. He's trying to take my throne. And so he takes up his army, and he goes after David again. And so what it seems like is David is dismissing Saul. He says, I know, Saul, you've repented, but you know the Lord will deliver me and all this. And when Saul goes away repentant, David says in his heart, I don't trust him. I don't trust Saul as far as I can throw him. And so I need to get out of here because one day I will perish. And what we actually see is that David was right in his assessment. I think David is actually acting righteously here. He knows that if he stays, Saul is eventually going to pursue him and going to kill him. And it turns out he goes to the land of the Philistines and Saul, who it seems like is going to mount up an attack against David, realizes he's gone to the Philistines and he goes, well, that's it. I'm not, I'm not going into the land of the Philistines to try to get David. So how do we think about this in terms of David actually acting righteously? Go back in 1 Samuel to chapter 23, verses 10 to 13. Chapter 23 10 to 13. Remember, David is in this scene. He's gone. The Philistines, ironically, have captured a city called Keilah. And David has gone to the city to relieve the people of Keilah of the Philistine presence. And once he gets into the city, he is trapped. It's sort of a, you, like you run cattle. It's a just straight shot right in there, right? He's surrounded by a fence with only one exit. And he realizes he's pinned in in this city. And so he realizes now Saul is going to come after him, and he's a sitting duck. He's an easy target pinned in this city. And so in verse 10, it says, Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Keilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant, And the Lord said, He will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, arose and departed from Keilah. And they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. So remember just a few chapters ago, David was pinned in in this city, and he asks the Lord, are the men of Keilah, when they realize it's either hand David over or face destruction at the hand of Saul, will they hand me over? And the Lord says, yes. This is a conditional understanding that the Lord, who has sovereign knowledge over not only what events will transpire, but what events could transpire, a conditional future. If I stay... Then the men will hand me over. Well, you might say, but but David's the anointed king. He's going to be protected. Under no circumstances is he going to die, then he would never sit on the throne. But God knows, yes, that's true. If you stay, though, you are going to be handed over into the hand of Saul. And so I think what's happening here in our text this morning is that David understands that if I stay here, in the same way that if I stayed in Keilah, Saul is going to come after me and kill me. So, I need to take up from here and go. Let's also remember that to go into the hands of the Philistines requires an immense amount of faith. David is not going to friends on the other side of the country. David is going to enemies. David has been to the land of the Philistines once before and has met the king Achish once before, you remember. 
He was also on the run from Saul. And he didn't have his men around him. And he didn't know what he was going to do because the men of the Philistines were going to hand him over to Achish. And so what does he end up doing? He disfigures his face, he spits on his beard, he acts like a crazy man. And they bring him before Achish, and Achish goes, do I need another crazy man in my kingdom? Go, away from here. And David actually writes a psalm of celebration. I can't believe he bought it. That was only by the hand of the Lord that he rescued me from the hand of Achish. So you understand, going into the land of the Philistines requires just as much faith as it would be to stay and face the wrath of Saul. So David is really leaving the frying pan and opting for the fire instead. And what we realize is that sometimes there is salvation in the fire away from the frying pan. My mind goes to Daniel chapter 3. Remember where Daniel and his friends are faced with the frying pan option of worshiping the idol that Nebuchadnezzar has erected in front of them. And the frying pan is worship false gods. The fire is quite literally a fire. If you don't, I'll throw you in the fire. And so they opt for the fire. And what happens, but the fire becomes literally their means of salvation. There this Christ figure shows up with them in their affliction and brings an end to it, allows them to persevere through fire. But you may have experienced this before in your life, where you're faced with an option, stay or move. And you don't want to move. You don't want to leave the place that you're comfortable with. You're facing all kinds of trouble moving, and yet it ends up being the blessing that you find in the long run, or, or an illness that comes along that you don't want, a cancer that, that's hard to endure, and yet you see your, your trust increase throughout that trial. Sometimes the fire actually becomes the method of salvation, and for David, him going into the fire away from the frying pan and escaping Saul actually becomes a good move for him. So this is what we see actually transpire in the chapter. David moves in and he goes up to, to, uh, to Achish there in, uh, in the land of the Philistines. And it turns out that Achish hands him a, a little province, a little, a little place for him to dwell called Ziklag. Now Ziklag is part of the territory of Judah. So here's what you've got to understand. The Philistines are owning property that they have no right to. You understand that? God has given the promised land to the nation of Israel. They've moved in, and yet in the, in the book of Judges, we find out they did not take all that was required for them to take. So all of their enemies are dwelling in this land, and their enemies have no right to this territory. Now, the, the city of Ziklag is in the territory of Judah. So David moves in, and Achish immediately gives him the territory of Ziklag, which really kind of belongs to him anyway. So immediately what we see is that that, uh, Achish is relinquishing part of the Philistine territory that they technically have possession of, and he's giving that to the rightful king over Israel. Then look at verse 6. This is what we find inserted here in verse 6. It said, So that day... Achish gave him Ziklag. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now, think about what was just said there by the author of 1 Samuel. Therefore, the city of Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. You understand that this is where we get the notion that this book was compiled after David died. That's that's tremendously important for what we're going to see here today. But understand this first. That the the city of Ziklag was given to the nation of Judah, and this is its source. And now every king after David had possession of the city of Ziklag. So this story that is recorded here in 1 Samuel 27 has been preserved for generation after generation to the nation of, of Israel. The question is, why? Why this story? 
Every time we read narrative in Scripture, every time, we have to ask the question, why am I being told this story and not another story? Isn't it John who tells us, oh man, the stories of Jesus could have filled all the books in the world, right? You, you couldn't possibly account for all the things he said and did. But then John tells you, but these have been recorded so that you might believe and by believing have life in his name. That is true of every narrative in Scripture. Every time there is a story recorded, there's not one line of it that's thrown away. Every line actually means something. And it's our job to ask, why this story? Why has this story been recorded for us? Why has it been preserved for generation after generation? David is given this small territory of Ziklag. It has been preserved throughout the generations, now belonging to Israel. And so this is, this is the beginning of what we realize to be a tremendous blessing. A territory that belonged to Judah to begin with, but then fell into the hands of the Philistines because of David's move across the country has now been given back to Israel. Blessing number one. So then we come to this question, why are we being told this story? And we actually get at the end of this chapter, I think an explanation as to why, but let's set it up first. So we come back to this question, why are we being told this story? So we've got all this background information. David is hiding from Saul amongst the Philistines. Saul won't pursue him because he's there. He's afraid of the Philistines. He's been given Ziklag as this small territory, and though it's still under Philistine oversight, he's been given it to kind of take up residence there. But then we learn something in verses 8 to 11. Look at it. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For these were the inhabitants of the land from of old. Pin that in your mind. Underline it if you write in your Bible. As far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments and come back to Achish. When Achish asked, where have you made, your, made a raid today? David would say, against the Negev of Judah, or against the Negev of the Jeremalites, or against the Negev of the Kenites. And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking lest they should tell about us, and say, so David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. So let's understand what's happening here. David is with his men, making raids into neighboring towns. And we're told who those towns are. Specifically, we're told it's the Geshurites, the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. And David is routing them from where he dwells all the way to the border of Egypt. He is either driving them out or killing them altogether so that there's not a tongue that could come back and tell the story. And then when he goes back to, uh, to Achish in the land... He tells him something different. He lies to him. He deceives him. He tells him, I, I went to Judah. Now, let's think about it this a couple ways. First of all, let's look at the people that he's driving out. You've got three names, the Geshurites. The Geshurites are important because we know who they are. In fact, we're told in Joshua 13 too, that they were a people that had still been left to be driven out by the people of Israel that they never did drive out. So, this is an enemy of the Lord that still occupies the land, and the Israelites had been, con uh, had been okay with just letting them dwell there. They hadn't actually gone in and driven them out. And then you get the Gerzites. This is the first time the word the Gerzites appears in the text of Scripture, but it is very close to the name of a people that dwell in Gezer. So, Gezer... Gearsites, you can hear the similarity in those terms. And there's good reason to believe these are the same people. And if they are the same people, they're mentioned in Joshua 16.10 and in Judges 1.29, specifically called out as people that not only did Israel not drive out, but they kept on as slaves. And then they adopted their gods 
and which led them into idolatry, which is part of the reason we're in the situation we're in right now, right? So you've got the Geshurites, you've got the Gerzites, and then you've got the Amalekites. We've seen them in this book. Remember, these are the people that in 1 Samuel 15, uh, Saul is told, go up against the Amalekites and take them all down. Does Saul do it? No, he goes in and he leaves some alive and he takes some captive. In fact, that's the reason why God rejects him. It's sort of the last straw, if you will, as to why God rejects him. Is you didn't listen to me and kill all of them. I'm judging them and you didn't do that for me. So what do we find David doing when he gets over to this land? He's driving out the enemies of the Lord. You see this? He's going into the land that has now been given to him. He now has Ziklag that he didn't have before. And he's now going up against the enemies that were told to Israel, you've got to drive them out. In fact, enemies that Saul was supposed to drive out and he never did. So not only that, but the commander of the armies of the Lord, which is Abner at this point, who is Saul's right-hand man, is supposed to take up this job. Abner is the one that's supposed to go and fight all these people, and Abner's not doing it. In fact, when David goes over into that territory, Saul says, I'm not touching him, and backs up. Abner, we can take it, we assume, also says, well, then I won't touch it either if you're not going with me. They don't even want to go over into that area. David has now gone over into that area, and he's taking all the territory back for the Lord. So is David in sin in going over to the Philistines and not trusting the Lord, or is David acting in faith? It seems like David is acting in faith because he's carrying out all the things that he was commissioned to do as a commander of the army of the Lord back when he was Saul's right-hand man. Right? So now he's going into the land and he's driving them out. But then we also learn that David is doing it covertly. He's doing it undercover. He's not telling uh, uh, Achish all the things that, that he's actually doing. In fact, he's misleading him. Now, why is he doing this? You have to understand, Achish wouldn't mind. These are all enemies to the Philistines too. Achish wouldn't mind if he's going in and driving out his enemies. He's not going to care if David goes in and plunders the Amalekites and says, I conquered the Amalekites for you. Here's all their goods and gives them to it. No, Achish wouldn't care at all. So why is it that David says, I went against Judah? He says, I went against, there was, there's three people in there. There's the Jeremalites, there's the Kenites. The Kenites were descendants of Moses' father-in-law. The Jeremalites are tribes of Judah. And then he, he says, I went against Judah as well. And, and he, it says he did this his entire time he was there. A year and four months, we learn in verse 7. So why is it that he's telling him a lie when Achish wouldn't care if he was going against Achish's enemies? And the reason is because he wants Achish to think that he's making himself a stench with his own people. He wants to gain Achish's trust. Why do you think that is? Because Achish is also an enemy of God. How is it that the king of Israel can go into the land and conquer the Philistines who are at this point probably the most mighty army there is? You gain their trust first. David is going to gain his trust so much that at the end of the passage, <laughs> Achish is going to make him his bodyguard. But this is where we get to the, the real crux of the matter. He's doing this covertly, but what, what, the, what the author tells us is a bit of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is where you know something happening in the story that one of the main characters does not know. In this case, you know something about David that Achish does not know. What is it that you know that Achish does not know? You know that David is going into territories that are enemies of the Lord and he's conquering them. You know that. And then you also know that David is coming back to Achish, paying tribute to him and telling him a lie to try to gain his trust. But Achish has no clue that that's what's happening. So this is the dramatic irony that's coming in the story. And the reason that for this passage being preserved throughout time and that we're reading it today, that I'm preaching it and you're hearing it, is precisely for what happens in verse 12. Look at what happens in verse 12. And Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. 
Think about what Akish is saying. Akish is the king of the Philistines, right now foremost among the Lord's enemies in the land. They occupy tons of territory. They have a fierce army. And God has selected his king, David, called him out among shepherding sheep, brought him to the Valley of Elah where he takes down the big Philistine Goliath. And here is David on the run from Saul and Achish, the commander of the Lord's enemies, thinks that God's king is going to serve him. Is he? Think about what this means for generations of Jews. Achish, enemy of God, thinks that he can make God's king his servant. He even makes him his bodyguard. Keeps him forever. You're going to go with me into battle against your own people. We know you want them dead. Think about what this means for generations following David. Here's a person that's living under Solomon's rule. Or under Rehoboam's rule. Or flash forward, they're all the way out into Babylon in exile. And they're reading 1 Samuel 27 in some religious ceremony that they've cobbled together on their streets in captivity. What do you think that this passage has to say to them who are in captivity, who are hearing a foreign enemy say, God's king is my servant? What do you think this means for them when they look down the road and they see, they see Nebuchadnezzar's palace down the road? Nebuchadnezzar, who conquered Israel and brought them into captivity in Babylon. What do you think it says to those captives who hear this Philistine king say, I have made the king of Israel my servant. What do you think it says to them when they know, no, you haven't? What confidence is there left for the Israelite who's reading this, getting up from his seat after their service is over, knowing that actually, Achish, you never did have control over David. You thought you did, but you didn't. David, it turns out, actually has control over you. David is the one manipulating you. First, this passage, because it was written after David was dead, as we saw in verse 6, we see that this is preserved for generation after generation, so it brings comfort to those people who read it, knowing that if God has called a king, if God has anointed a king, no enemy can put him underfoot. No enemy can trample him. So there's a confidence in knowing that, but second, there's very obviously a point to this story that's recorded for not only all of Israel to read about David and the kings that follow his line, but also from us. You understand that, that David right now is setting up what it will be like to be the king that God has established. So we're understanding now from 1 Samuel that not only has God established David as king, but he has established his whole line. We're going to see this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God promises David he will never lack someone on the throne. So the promise that the people generations following David are seeing is that not only is David on the throne, but God has promised that he will have a, an heir always on the throne. So that means even if we're in exile without a king of Israel over us, we still know God is keeping track. God has a promise. And God's enemies will never conquer what God has done. In fact, what they're walking away with is this very simple statement. The Lord grants victory to His king even in service to His enemies. So even in the event that God's king looks as though He's in service to His enemies, God will still grant him victory. So generation after generation that reads this passage in the Old Testament is walking away encouraged, thinking if a son of David is my king, 
then I have absolutely nothing to fear because I know that God will always grant him victory. Whether he's in the frying pan or in the fire, it doesn't matter. God is still with him and God is still granting him victory. But then let's cross the Rubicon from Malachi into Matthew. And what is it that we find for the New Testament Christian to think? Well, it's actually still the same thing, but it's actually been heightened now in the New Testament era for us as Christians in the church. Because we're not following an ordinary king. We're not following merely one from the line of David. We're following the king from David's line. The one who is foretold from all time, who will be the king who sits on the throne, whose kingdom will not have an end. So what does it say to you, Christian, if you're following not just David, but David's ultimate heir in Christ? What does it say to you when that heir came to earth, took on the flesh of a man, being fully God and fully man, gave himself into his enemies. His greatest enemy, death, is left thinking, I've got him now, just like Achish does. But you know the story. What happens three days following his death? That same king gets up from the grave. Who was in control of whom? Who had power over Whom? Well, it appears in the story of Christ, the ultimate fulfillment of David, that no enemy actually had him underfoot, even though for a short while it looked like he was really in the fire. And three days later, he rises from the dead. The events of David's life, you understand, are a microcosm of what Jesus is ultimately going to fulfill. The Old Testament is laying down a foundation, a very imperfect foundation, but a foundation for us to understand what God's King would actually do, what kind of victory God's King was actually promised. And it will eventually culminate in Christ. So then you tell me, what is the Christian supposed to walk away with? What is the Christian who falls in the kingdom of Christ, supposed to walk away with from a story like this, where he falls into enemy territory, but we know ultimately has the upper hand. So when the Christian walks away from this passage, what we come to know and understand is that no matter how desperate the situation the Christian is in, We're assured of eventual victory, not because we're so good, not because we've got it all figured out or we're smarter than the rest. The victory has been purchased for us by Christ. But let's take a minute and let's clarify, shall we? What does it mean that we have victory in Christ? Is it as some people claim, because you're a Christian, God wants for you all the health, wealth, and prosperity this world could possibly offer? Does it mean that if you have faith, the cancer will be gone? And if the cancer is not gone, then you didn't have faith? Is that what it means? What what kind of victory does it mean that Christ has accomplished for the Christian? What kind of victory should I be trusting in and expecting? What kind of victory do I understand that I have? You have to understand that as a Christian, you're not promised healing, you're promised heaven. You're not promised prosperity, you're promised provision. You are promised earthly difficulty, and you're also promised eternal deliverance. See, the confidence that it gives to us is that we know, first of all, this world is not our home. So no matter what fires of affliction that we're thrown into, not only has Christ gone there first, but He has given to us an escape. One day, the cancer is going to win temporarily. One day, the job is going to be lost and not regained. 
One day the affliction is eventually going to overwhelm and my body is going to give way to the grave. It doesn't matter how much health, wealth, and prosperity you could possibly ever have faith in, how many times you could name and claim anything. Eventually you are going to die. What happens then? That's where the hope is. That's where the hope is. It's not in this world. It's in eternal life to come. That my King, who walked into death for me, got up from the grave, and not only did He do that, but then He said to death, the greatest enemy, not only did you not keep me down, but because I've atoned for the sins of all my people, you can't keep them them down either. So what he purchased for us was a resurrection from the dead. That's the hope that we have for all those who follow God's King. So whether you're a Jew after David's reign, looking at the King who is over you saying, if David's line is my King, then I know God's at least got his eye on me all the way now to the ultimate fulfillment of that in Christ, Christ who is God's King, if I am His, then no matter what affliction I go into, no matter if I'm in the frying pan or if I'm in the fire, I can endure not only because He is with me, but because I will have resurrection from the dead. But it should also serve as a warning to us. Woe to us, for following after Achish? Should we think that Jesus is our servant? I remember when I was in high school, there was a t-shirt that people would wear and it had a picture of Jesus on it and it said, Jesus is my homeboy. Some of you are like, Home what? (laughs) Jesus is my homeboy. We're friends. We're cool. There's an idea. You will be amazed at how prevalent it is as you talk to people. That Jesus is there to serve you. I sat in a Bible class in sixth grade where the Bible teacher said to us, God just wants to please us. A Christian Bible class. God just wants to please us. That is following after Achish. That is making the mistake of thinking that Jesus is my homeboy. He's here to serve me. He's my friend. He gives me all the things that I want. Anytime I have a wish, He grants it to me. I just name it and claim it and He gives it to me because He is here to benefit me. That is not what we find in not only 1 Samuel, but the rest of the Bible. It proclaims Jesus as King. The only way to be included in His kingdom is to bend your knee to the only one who deserves worship. It's to come before Him and own all of the sin that's in your life and to give it to Him and trust Him for forgiveness. For Him to call the shots. For Him to get to say. What you realize is He doesn't fail. He never does. His promises endure and we know There is affliction. You have either just come out of a trial, you're about to go in a trial, or you're currently in the middle of one. You know that as long as you live on this earth, there will be trial. Every day you will inch closer and closer to the grave. But what he's promised is the grave will not hold you. And God's king who can walk into enemy territory and deliver the victory for God is the one that's promised it. The question, as always, we come back to is, do you trust Him? There's a number of people 
in this congregation, some of which are firm in their relationship with Christ, some are on shaky ground, personally they feel that way, and some are questioning whether to believe or not. You understand, there's no bonus points. You don't come here and say, well, I've curried favor with God, and so now I leave, and He owes me something. I, you don't get before God on Judgment Day, and you say, well, look, I, I went to church. I did all the things that were required of me. There are no bonus points. You either submit to God's King, owning your sin, and receive in Him the fullness of life eternal. Face the fate of the Philistines. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, my prayer is that your word do the work in the hearts of your people. I can't know every situation present in this room. I can't know the backstories. I can't know what's ahead. I can't know the sufferings and all the trials. Only you know those things. And I pray that you would speak to your people. That you would apply this text in myriad ways that I can't even possibly fathom. That you would work through your spirit to convict your people of truth. That you would move in our hearts. That we might celebrate you as king over all. That we might come to revere you as our Lord, as our Savior, as the one who gives to us forgiveness. As the song tells us, you delight to bring us peace. I pray for those who are wandering and running and, and feverishly trying to figure this thing out, that you would break through and you would compel them to give their heart to you in trust, to repent of their sins, and to find the hope of eternal life only given through Christ. Father, only you can do that. And I pray, pray that you would. In Jesus' name, amen.